If a car is wildly successful, it's a recipe for printing money. If it's an abject failure, the manufacturer licks their wounds and moves on. What's maybe worse is when a car just does okay, especially when this car kicks off a whole new brand. Should you invest in a second generation car or more models or just give up? Will sales improve? What if they don't? What to do with all those new dealerships? When the Smart 42 launched as a Smart City Coupe, neither of its parents were sure that they should have birthed it. <laughs> That's never a good start. Just why did the Volkswagen Swatchmobile become a joint project between Mercedes and Chinese company Geely? And just how successful was this fun little city car anyway? This is a Smart for Two story. Switzerland has been known for many things over the years. Chocolate, cheese, army knives, cuckoo clocks, and of course watches. Two major companies that produced watches and their movements went bankrupt in the early 1980s after intense Japanese competition. They restructured into one company that became famous for those fashionable, brightly coloured swatch watches, the antithesis of Japanese monotone digital affairs. By paring down to just one third of the parts of previous Swiss watches, Swatch brought the company back to profitability. By 1994, Swiss watches held 53% of the world market. The instigator of all of this was CEO Nicholas Hayek, who had become a very rich man of course, and by the early 1990s he had bigger dreams. With a recent publicity of global warming, Hayek saw an opportunity for a car with an innovative new drivetrain that would be kinder to the environment. As he described it, it should be a fun, ecological and inexpensive city car for two people and two crates of beer. And it wouldn't cost more than 10,000 Swiss francs, about half the price of a mid-level Vauxhall Opel Astra. At that price, Hayek dreamt that, like the Swatch watches, customers would take his Swatchmobile to heart and personalise it. Hayek knew that competing with the big car companies was a recipe for disaster, so he canvassed various firms, entering into an agreement with Volkswagen in 1991. The German car giant saw the advantages of realising an ecological city car. They were being lambasted in the press about producing cars that were polluting the globe, and were keen to show that they were doing something about it. They also sensed a market opportunity selling to those who wanted a greener form of personal transport. General Motors was developing a fully electric vehicle, showing off the unfortunately named GM Impact prototype. California were legislating that 10% of cars sold in 12 years time needed to be electric. Having a low polluting city car would certainly help. Or so they hoped. Almost as soon as the partnership began, there were problems. Some developers in Volkswagen called the whole idea outright nonsense. Hayek's Swiss team wanted more concepts developed. Volkswagen didn't see the point. The Swiss team felt Volkswagen just wanted to make a regular car with two seats instead of four. And what was the point in that? The car was meant to be a game changer. They wanted the powertrain to be truly innovative, either hybrid or fully electric. These were the days before the Toyota Prius and Honda Insight. There wasn't a successful hybrid or electric vehicle on the road. If you don't count milk floats, that is. Volkswagen had some experience with both though, producing a hybrid diesel Golf and a fully electric Golf. But by using lead acid batteries, either vehicle was particularly effective. The relationship got worse after Ferdinand Piech's ascendancy to the Volkswagen throne in 1993. He didn't see the point of this side project and poured scorn on the prototype, saying if one of my researchers were to hand me such a vehicle, he'd no longer be at his post. Hayek and his team saw the writing on the wall and started shopping their city car project around to other suitors. Despite Ferdinand Piech's comments though, some engineers saw real promise in this innovative design. By 1994, the Swatchmobiles team had found a new home. Mercedes-Benz. The chief engineer they chose to bring this new car to life was a good choice. 
Johann Tom Ford had designed a two-seat electric city car in 1972, and this concept formed the basis for Mercedes' 1981 NAFA concept. He'd also worked on the Vision A93 that would form the basis for the Mercedes-Benz A-Class. The new team were quick to show off two concepts, hurriedly created by Mercedes Design Studio in California. The Eco Speedster used a petrol engine, while the Eco Sprinter was fully electric, with solar cells on the roof to cool the interior. Both cars were tiny, just two and a half meters long, that's a full 56 centimeters shorter than the old Austin Mini. The passenger seat sat a little further back, so the narrow car could still give enough shoulder space for both occupants. The 40 kilowatt motor, or three cylinder engine, drove the rear wheels, and the Speedster had a removable Targa roof. The new car would be called the Smart, much to Nicholas Hayek's chagrin. He'd wanted to use the Swatch name, but Mercedes turned him down, and as they had 51% of the shares in the new joint venture, they had the deciding vote. To assuage him, Smart stood for Swatch Mercedes Art. Things didn't get better once serious work began though. Mercedes wanted to use an internal combustion engine, but Hayek wanted it to be a hybrid or an electric. Matters came to a head, and many of the original creative team left, leaving Mercedes as the driving force behind the project. Several of those who left would go on to create their own vision of an ecological city car, the three-wheeled electric Cree Sam in 2001. But relying on lead acid batteries, it was limited to a top speed of 52 miles an hour and a range of only 43 miles. 80 cars were made and marketed through a Swiss supermarket, but a lack of interest meant the company folded in 2003. Mercedes weren't opposed to alternative powertrains though, they were working on vehicles using batteries and fuel cells, and they were still keen on this city car vision. After making luxury cars for decades, Mercedes felt they needed to expand into the mass market to survive. They were working on their new small car, the Mercedes A-Class, so a city car, a vehicle that had little to no competition, seemed a good bet. Cities were becoming more crowded and polluted, and some cities were looking to impose congestion charges. The new smart car looked like something that could sell well. Dealerships were lined up, with projections of selling 200,000 smart cars every year. In true Swatch fashion, three different concepts were shown in 1996, the Atlanta, Paris and Modular. The thinking was that a smart car could easily change its looks by bolting on new panels from the dealership. Like the Swatch watch, this would be a changing personal statement. And with it being so fashionable, the goal was to regularly update the design and it would use petrol, diesel, hybrid, and electric drivetrains. But Smart started to have doubts that they could actually sell 200,000 cars a year. Likely influenced by BMW's work on the C1, Mercedes started developing an enclosed motorcycle with the aim of using spare production capacity at the Smart factory. It may have turned into the F300 Lifejet concept, but with the C1 selling poorly, nothing more was heard of a Mercedes motorcycle. Another concept appeared in 1997, the Smart City Fashion Victim, showing something closer to the final car. Test production began in the French factory dubbed Smartville, aiming for an assembly time of only four and a half hours. That was far less than even Japanese cars, but to be fair, there was a lot less to book together but it was partly down to Nicholas Hayek's obsession from his time making Swatch watches of reducing component count to the absolute minimum. Those components, more often than not, came from external companies such as VDO, manufactured on site in ancillary buildings around the Cross-like main factory. Mercedes-Benz were used to making much of the car themselves, but by relying on part suppliers it limited their investment and risk, useful as some within Mercedes were sceptical the car would be a success. They couldn't just rely on suppliers though, more money was needed to get the smart car to production. Nicholas Hayek's company shied away from the investment, maybe because it had moved so far away from his original vision. This left Mercedes to invest an additional 240 million Deutschmarks, increasing their stake in the smart venture from 51 to 
Production was to begin in October 1997, but the Mercedes A-Class, which launched that same month, suffered a disaster with their new car failing the infamous Moose test. The smart car was also a high-sided short car, so changes to fix its stability were rushed through. They lowered the center of gravity, widened the track, stiffened the suspension, changed the steering, and added ballast to the front. The updated version will be shown as a concept at the Turin Motor Show in the spring of 1998, but this was essentially the final car. Better late than never, the new Smart City Coupe debuted at the 1998 Paris Motor Show. Through all of the chaos since the 1994 first concept, the car had changed remarkably little. It was still a minuscule two and a half meters long. Being so short, it could be parked head in on the side of a street, only taking up one and a half meters of space. It still held two people and their beer, with the passenger seat a little further back to give enough shoulder space. Those interchangeable body panels made it to the final car, meaning you could make the car as individual as you wanted. For a small car, the two occupants were surprisingly comfortable, and there was enough boot space for the supermarket shop so long as you weren't buying the Christmas turkey. The interior was well appointed with optional extras, a CD player, cup holder, heated leather seats and steering wheel, air conditioning, and a glass roof that gave a light airy cockpit. A cassette or CD storage unit was a nice touch. Standard features included electric windows and a semi-automatic six-speed gearbox, perfect for city driving, as long as you didn't mind waiting for it to change gear. And like the outside, parts could be swapped out if you felt like a change. Smart new prospective customers would have safety concerns, so the Smart City Coupe had drivers and passenger airbags with optional side airbags, ABS, traction control, and a safety cell that was so strong it could survive being stomped on by Godzilla or whatever this thing was. It scored three stars in the Euro NCAP safety test. Nicholas Hayek thought dealerships should have large glass storage towers that highlighted the car, so smart lighthouses popped up all over Europe. But to Nicholas Hayek's disappointment, the car was only available as a turbocharged petrol engine, with the promise of a diesel hybrid and electric version soon. It was all too much for him, and that same year, Hayek and Mercedes-Benz parted ways. Smart was now wholly owned by Mercedes-Benz, and by extension Chrysler, who had just merged with Daimler-Benz. Hayek might have felt a petrol engine wasn't green enough, but the engine was frugal, helping to lower CO2 emissions with a combined 59 imperial miles per gallon. With the tiny 600cc engine tuned for emissions and frugality, it didn't win any speed awards, but it was a city car, so it didn't need to. An 800cc turbo diesel arrived in 2000, delivering the lowest CO2 emissions of any car, handy as some countries were giving rebates on low emission vehicles. The range expanded to the least expensive cabrio in the world, and it had an electronic folding soft top. Sales expanded to right-hand drive countries such as the UK, where the Smarty was available in more colours than that other kind of Smarty. The coupe entered the Japanese market in 2001 as the Smart K. The smaller rear bumper and narrower track and wheels helped it qualify as a K car. But what this small city runabout really needed was a makeover from a competition tuning specialist. Or maybe not. Well, regardless, Brabus worked their magic on the Smart with sporty body panels, bigger wheels, a lower suspension, flappy paddle gear changers, an electric sunroof, a better sound system, optional sat-nav, and engine tuning that boosted the power to, hold on to your hats, 70 horsepower. That was enough to get it to 60 in a shade under 17 seconds. This tuning package was definitely to improve the safety and performance of this car, as Smart had said, and not at all to sell a premium version to people who had the disposable income to throw at it. 
Despite special Brabus editions, sales were falling below expectations though. Only about 100,000 were sold every year, about half of what Smart had expected, and they were losing money on every car they sold. That didn't stop at least one copy though. The Chinese Shangyuan Noble clearly had influences from the Smart City Coupe. Being 50 centimeters longer with the engine up front though, it could cram in four people, probably in some discomfort. On the one hand, the Smart City was a sensible commuter vehicle, but on the other, it was a playful expression of yourself, just begging for a fun days out. Smart answered this demand with the Crossblade, a Smart City without a roof, windscreen or doors. The concept was shown in 2001 with limited production for 2000 fun lovers in 2002. A proper sports car version of the Smart Car was already in development. The 2002 Smart Roadster was Smart's second model and used a stretch version of the Smart City platform. An update arrived in 2003. Petrol engine got a modest power increase, but other than the new colours, little changed. The main change to happen in 2004 was a name change. With Smart releasing a car with four seats, the Smart 4.4, it made sense to rename the Smart City as the Smart 4.2. In 1995, Smart's management had said, this car will not live for eight years. That is, such a fashionable car would get regular updates. Smart tried out a new look for the 4.2 as the Crosstown concept in 2005. The oval shape gave way to a chunkier look, something between an original Mini and a Land Rover Defender. It got a removable roof and windscreen and an instrument cluster that would have been a nightmare to read. It used a hybrid engine that wasn't a hybrid, but more on that later. Smart also experimented with a compressed natural gas concept the following year. The Smart company lost any vestiges of being independent when it merged into the unhappy Daimler Chrysler partnership in 2006. And like the Chrysler division, Smart was losing money. 3.4 billion pounds between 2003 and 2006 if you included sales of all European smart cars, it wasn't looking much better. Mercedes cast around to partners such as Peugeot for future collaborations to save costs and considered carrying smart cars in Mercedes dealerships to help its exposure. Those expensive dealerships with large glass towers made way for more modest affairs and the smart Roadster and 4.4 were cut. Maybe the second generation would spark more interest. The length increased to a massive 2.7 meters, so parking face-in on city streets was harder, but it helped satisfy world pedestrian safety rules. 90% of the car was new, although it looked very similar from the outside and came as both a coupe and a cabrio. Inside it was a different story though, with a whole new look, and city driving was a little easier with optional power steering. The petrol engine was all new, a one litre three cylinder from Mitsubishi that delivered up to 101 horsepower in Brabus form that got the car to 60 in under 10 seconds. The six speed gearbox became a five speed, but the automatic shifting still wasn't anything to write home about. The diesel engine was part of the 10% that was carried over from the old car. Smart also touted their micro hybrid drive but it wasn't much more than a fancy start-stop system that replaced the starter motor, but it improved the already impressive fuel economy by 8%. A year later, the first electric Smart 4.2 made its appearance. A hundred were tested by various organizations. Nicholas Hayek may have finally been pleased with how his little car was developing. You might think that the USA would be the last place to embrace funny little micro cars, but it wasn't such a crazy idea. Toyota had sold the Yaris and Honda had the fit. BMW and Volkswagen showed cute cars could sell there with the Mini and the Beetle. Mercedes announced that the Smart 4.2 would be sold in the US and was surprised to get 20,000 pre-orders, but it was intended to be a much more triumphant entry to the country. The Smart 4 More SUV based on the Mercedes GLK class was supposed to be the launch vehicle, but with Smart's money problems, the four more didn't make it to production. Back on the home front, Smart got its first serious competition in Europe with Toyota's iQ, which would be sold in North America in 2012 as the Scion iQ. 
Even with this competition, Smart 42 sales had turned around. It had a record year with almost 140,000 sales worldwide. With Daimler shaking off Chrysler and themselves having a bumper year, there was more money to invest in future smart models. Or so they thought. The global recession put a dampener on things, but it still allowed the Smart 42 to be improved with a facelift in 2010. The instrument cluster got a natty dot matrix display, and Smart offered a surround sound multimedia system with Bluetooth. More changes came in 2012, with a bigger front grille and a total of eight airbags, enveloping the occupants in explosive padding in the event of an accident. The usual Brabus and plethora of special editions kept the car in the public eye, but it didn't do much to boost sales. Production of the electric version began in 2009, with just a few hundred vehicles. Battery tech came from Tesla, giving the new electric smart a range of 87 miles. A full production rollout came in 2011, selling almost 9,000 cars until the next generation 4.2 arrived in 2014. For this, the third generation car, Mercedes partnered with Renault to share the cost of development. The new 4.2 would share a platform with the 4.4, bought back from the dead, and Renault's new Twingo. This was a brand new car, sharing nothing with the previous 4.2, except for the cheeky two-colour looks, of course. It wasn't any longer, but it was 10 centimetres wider, which translated to a more spacious feeling in both seats, which could now sit alongside each other. It also made the car feel more stable on the road at high speeds, and there was a system to correct the steering and crosswinds. A big, or should that be a small change, was the much tighter turning circle from almost 9 metres on the old car to under 7 metres, the tightest turning circle of any mainstream car at the time. The petrol engine was all new, a 900cc or 1 litre three-cylinder that felt more powerful on the road even though the figures didn't show much of a change. The diesel was dropped, but there was still an electric version. The Petrol Smart got a standard manual for the first time, dropping the semi-automatic that some found annoying, and a standard automatic was also available. Inside, of course, it was all new, but it hadn't lost its sense of fun with round air vents and lots of colour. The optional panoramic roof gave an open-air feel, and there was lots of storage space. By moving the battery, passenger legroom improved. The subwoofer in the boot took up some space, but could be removed for those days you didn't want to turn your car into a mobile nightclub. The tiny size and practicality of the Smart 4.2 kept some customers coming back, and here's what one of them thinks about his third generation car. I'm on my third Smart for two, and let me tell you what I like about them. Obviously, the size is an important factor. They're surprisingly well built. I've never had any issues with them. And any time anyone gets in one of these, they're always like amazed that the thing just feels so solid. The turning circle, that's crazy. It feels like it kind of turns on itself, but now let me show you what I've been carrying around in the back of here, because this is the one that nobody really mentions as being a big positive. But to me, I love it. It's like a little van, this thing. Just to give you a demonstration today, I put some crates in here. This is how much I'm able to fit in the back of my Smart for two. And part of the reason behind that is because the seats in here are designed to restrain the luggage that's in the back. They go right up to the ceiling with the headrest. Also, you can fold the passenger seat flat so you could load things all the way through the vehicle. Let me show you though, the thing that very few people mention, but is my number one favorite feature. Plastic door panels. You know how it is, you come back to your car in a car park, it's got a nasty dint in the side here where someone's flung their door into yours. But when it comes to this, I'll shove it between two SUVs, it doesn't matter to me, because you can't damage the thing. So that's my number one feature on the Smart for two, something I wish more manufacturers had. Plastic panels. The Cabrio version arrived in 2016, but sales of the 4.2, the 4.4 and the Twingo, all built on the same platform, were about as small as the 4.2's turning circle. Mercedes other businesses were booming, and they'd expected Smart sales to do the same. The Smart EQ Vision 4.2 showed off Smart's future electric autonomously driving cars. All they had to do was perfect autonomous driving, something that no one had perfected yet. 
Smart were betting big on electric cars though, planning to go fully electric by 2020. Yet by 2018, there was up to a year's waiting list for an electric Smart 4.2 as Mercedes had badly miscalculated the demand for its car. And to make matters worse, Smart sales were going down, not up. The division can't have been making much money, if any. Something had to be done. In 2019, Mercedes announced a sale of 50% of Smart to Chinese car company Geely. European production would end and all smarts would be designed and produced by Geely in China. This was a good deal for Geely, it gave them an established brand to enter the European market. There were plans to build two different smart SUVs and throw off the playful, fun image to become a sensible premium brand. There was a lot of value in the smart brand, but maybe not in the cars that they produced. The Smart for 2 2019 update retained the two-tone colour on the outside, but the interior would be a solid wall of black. True to their word, Smart became a purely EV brand, but with a range of only 80 miles, the 4.2 remained a short-range city car. The four-seat Smart Hash 1 concept looks like it will go into production, so the next 4.2 may be a shortened version of this car, or it may be dropped altogether. In a world where most cars drive along without a passenger, let alone anyone in the back seat, Nicholas Hayek's eco-busting city car vision made a lot of sense and picked up some loyal fans along the way. But despite tax incentives, there just wasn't the demand, and they were at least 10 years too early to take advantage of electric and hybrid drivetrains. Smart city car experiment hasn't led to riches. But designing such a small car has surely helped Mercedes-Benz learn to make their smaller mass-market vehicles. Nicholas Hayek and Mercedes didn't create a new category, there'd been bubble cars in the 1950s, but they revived a category with a modern twist into something tiny yet very practical with heaps of character. Many thanks to Tecmoan for his insight. In 2012, he compared his Smart for 2 to a Toyota IQ, and there's a link to that video on the right. There's also the usual optional extra video where I talk more about the 4.2 with maybe a bit of opinion, and there's a lot more to talk about. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you in the next video.